or fake. You know, all they're saying is, oh, it's not fair that he caught us and released all the info. <laughs> but they're twisting it in making people think that he actually somehow changed the vote. And our computer is basically showing that, that Trump was going to win anyhow. And um, it was the same thing with Brit Exit. It's, you know, our computer there forecast that would, would work as well. And, and I, I came out and I warned that, okay, fine. It, you know, if, he, if you get a significant majority beyond what they can manipulate, then it should go through. And they did. Uh, this, the uh, Scottish election wasn't, it was much closer. So they were basically, and they got caught on throwing all kinds of stuff out. Um, and, but, you know, Brussels itself sent people over to count the Scottish votes, <laughs> I mean, which really made sense, you know. Um, but it's, it, we're really looking at a global issue. And, and that's the, most of the problem because the U.S. press, um, I agree, it really is fake. Uh, and it's it's pretty bad. People don't realize how it actually functions. I mean, you can have a journalist who really wants to tell the truth, and he can write a story, and it goes upstairs to the editors, and it's the editors who change everything. So, you know, that's simply the way it goes. And, and this isn't about honest journalism or anything like that. I mean, the the mainstream media, they're all major corporations now. So it's no different than talking about Goldman Sachs or anybody else. They get a call and they, hey, okay, fine, we'll do this or we'll do that. Um, and it, it's all paybacks and, and okay, fine, we'll take care of you. And that's how everything is basically being manipulated. It's it's uh, pretty pathetic, but um, the, the press in this country has, has followed the same path path as, as Pravda did during the communist regime. <laughs> I mean, yeah. What are you going to say? It's, uh, they preach the party line all the time, and, and that's pretty much it. But So this is really um, about a, a revolution, is what it is. It, it, and you're seeing it in Europe, you're seeing it everywhere. And it's effectively, from World War II, all governments do the same. They just spend whatever they need to. They constantly borrow. There's no intention of paying anything back. And the standard of living keeps declining and declining. And so what happens is, is, is that, I mean, you even take Obamacare. I mean, the Supreme Court upheld it. Why? Because they looked at it and said, look, it's a tax. And the government has the right to tax. And it really is. That's all it is. And instead of covering the people who could not supposedly get insurance, um, Obamacare just simply passed this law and forced the youth to buy insurance. Otherwise, they're going to have to pay fines. So, you know, it, it, it effectively forced the youth to buy insurance that they didn't need. Rather than the government just paying for this, um, I mean, my own health insurance doubled. Uh, and I had Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and they canceled my initial policy. And I said, why? You know, and they said, oh, it doesn't comply with Obamacare. I said, What's, what doesn't it comply with? And they said, oh, you don't have uh, paternity and maternity leave. <laughs> yeah. I said, what? <laughs> You know, I don't want that, you know. Um, then the new policy they sent me, I mean, it's real. It's really a joke. They sent me two cards. And one says for me, and it says single. And the other one is for my children. I called them on the phone. And I said, I don't have young children. And they said, oh, you're not paying anything more. But by law, you have to have it. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, I'm not paying anything more. I'm just paying twice as much as what I had before. <laughs> but um, so... It, it really is just a tax, and it's the same thing as Social Security. He decided to, to impose uh, effectively a Obamacare tax on the, the youth to pay for the older generation, which is the same scheme as Social Security. And um, the problem is, is that, you know, you know, the Democrats or the Clintons, when they were in power, you know, they're the ones that made student loans non-dischargeable bankruptcy. I remember. To help the bankers. The bankers said, oh, gee, you know, you want us to lend money, to, you know, to these kids, but they have no collateral. You got to eliminate their right to go bankrupt. So they did. But then the, the bankers, what did they do? They get the parents to co-sign still. 
Mm-hmm. So now they have the parents' house, and the parents can't declare bankruptcy either. So it's very clever. I mean, but they're putting all this burden on the youth, and they have student loans. And I mean, Forbes magazine came out and said over 60% of the people cannot find a job and what they have a degree in. Um, now you put on all this Obamacare. You're wondering why now um, the average age of, of kids still living with parents is into the 30s now. Scary. Um, I mean, I was out of house by the time I was 17. You know? Same here. Uh, um, you know, what are we doing to the youth? How are they going to, to get out of all this stuff? In Europe, you're seeing the same problem. The unemployment among the youth is 60%. I mean, this is dangerous stuff because this is eventually bubbles up and this is what revolution is comes from. So it's, you know, I don't know, you know, they just, the press keeps, oh, you know, the poor people that can't get insurance. Look, I would absolutely take Obamacare, throw the whole thing out. Anybody that can't get insurance, they should be on, 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 Med, on uh, Medicaid. Yeah. And I would order basically all the, everybody else's insurance must be restored to what it was before. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, Get the burden away from the youth. I mean, this is the generation that's coming up, and and they're saddled with more debt than any other generation in history. So I don't, you know, economically, it it just it's it's brain dead. And you have these people that keep talking about wonderful ideas and protesting, and they don't understand what they're even protesting about. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? They really don't know what they're protesting about. They don't. I mean, you know, they call, you know, Trump a racist. Why? Oh, because you got a Muslim ban. Well, Muslim's not race, okay? It's religion. Yeah. I have Muslim people working in our company. You know, mm-hmm. what's the problem? You know, yeah. they're, um, we have Muslims that are from Switzerland and, and Ireland. They fly over here for meetings. No problem coming in. They're from, not from those six countries. That's all. Mm-hmm. Um, but they twist it into making oh it's a it's a racist ban or Muslim ban. It's it's not. It's it's just basically looking at the six countries that where terrorism does come from. Um, and it wasn't a permanent ban. It was just saying that they should be checked out more. Yeah. But you know everything is just really distorted dramatically, and um, and that's the problem. We we can't reach any kind of uh, a a commonality here. And and I think this is. You know, this is part of what our computer's been forecasting, and the peak in government was 2015.75, which was October 1st. Mm-hmm. And you got the first rate hike in December. I mean, everything's been downhill absolutely from there on. Um, and every other political election, okay, fine, you didn't like Obama but or Carter or, or, or vice versa or Bush or whatever. You know, people didn't go out and start burning cars and, and protesting for months and months and months. I mean, you just you got on with your life. That was it. Mm-hmm. Um, this one is just not going that way. And they're, they're deliberately trying to, to prevent any kind of changes. And it's not going to work because, I mean, honestly, you get rid of Trump and you're just going to end up really in, in a bloody civil war. Yeah. And civil wars always come from from class, you know, class wars. I mean, that's how they all begin going after, you know, the the Jews in Germany. It started out class war. Oh, it's the Jewish bankers. Then they moved. Well, it's the Jewish businessmen. Then eventually goes, oh, how would it's all, you know, but it begins always as some sort of a class dispute. And. And throughout history, it's always that way. Everything you look at, it's always a class issue, and it's rich against poor, and that's always been exploited. And that's where all the violence historically comes from. Um, Revolutions in Russia, you know, the same thing, China. So um, I don't know. We just seem to be in in a situation where politicians are are flirting with the most dangerous thing historically that anybody can do. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the, I would say, the biggest risk we have going forward in, in time. But um, our, our computer is projecting that basically this is kind of like the end of the Western culture, per se, and the financial capital of the world will leave the United States and go to China, but probably around 2032. The same way that we took it from Britain in 1914, and then we, you know, it moves around the world globally. 
Yeah. And it's never stayed in one place. So um, Spain had it, and it moved from Spain, went up to Britain, you know. And so this is where it goes, you know. And um, unfortunately, but I mean, it doesn't mean that we're society is is finished. I mean, you know, Britain is still there. Yeah. It's just no longer the financial capital of the world. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like to me the U.S. has been going downhill since uh, the end of World War II, with some with some exceptions uh, during the uh, tech boom, during the internet boom, but really the corruption, it just seems to be no limit to the corruption. And what's going to take us out of this tailspin? What's going to happen? Is it a cycle? Usually, I mean, that, that just leads to uh, revolution. I mean, that's effectively the end result. Um, the corruption is, is way too high. And, and you see, you know, like the media is just part of the whole problem. I mean, you take Hillary, okay, and they say, oh, it was, you know, pay for play. Oh, and the press defended her. No, no, no. Clinton Foundation is legitimate. As soon as she lost the election, what happened? All the countries that were donating money to her, like Saudi Arabia, yeah, stopped. they cut it off. Yeah. Okay. Like they will, women have to wear burqas over there and they'll execute you if you're gay. So they're donating money to her for women's rights and gay rights. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Not at all. Um, they're basically, you know, buying influence. That's all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's not just her. I mean, the whole political system is, is bad. And, and I'm not, I mean, Trump is a symptom of trying to reverse it and bring it back. I mean, I don't think he will succeed. Um, I think that fine, he may lower the taxes, maybe we get that through, but, but you know, they'll come back. Um, yeah, they always do. And I mean, I was in, involved in trying to save Social Security, working on Capitol Hill, going back and forth. And, and I was working, trying to, to help Bill Archer get through the, the, the retail sales tax and repeal the income tax. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dick Armey was uh, the head of the Republicans at the time, and he was on the flat tax. I couldn't get the two of them to even sit down and talk. So I was shuttling back and forth <laughs> between them. And they're both Republicans and both from Texas. Right? Mm -hmm. And I was in, in Dick's office, and he's got his you know cowboy boots up and smoking in there like he always did. And he said, Marty, he says, look, I'm going to tell you plainly and simple. He says, I can't support what, what Bill's doing because you won't repeal constitutionally the income tax. He says, so what will happen? And he says, you know, cycles, when the Democrats come back in, we'll have both. You know, I just looked at him. I said, you know something, Dick, you're right. And I gave up. <laughs> um, so it was just a nice exercise, taught me a lot about Capitol Hill, but, but it's, you can't get anything done. Mm -hmm. So I don't see, if Trump gets his tax cuts in, that's very nice. But then you're going to have elections coming up in 2018. They can reverse everything again. And that's the problem in the United States. It, it is why have big co corporations moved offshore? And I testified before the House Ways and Means Committee on this. It's, it's very simple. Would you sign a contract for to rent a house? that said the landlord can change your rent anytime he wants if he needs money. You know, what's the purpose of signing a lease? All right, you effectively have American companies and if they're gonna build a, a plant, okay, very nice. They work out a business plan and that business plan is based upon the current tax rate. Mm -hmm. Now you change that tax rate, all of a sudden the business plan is no good anymore. So yeah. most of the people that have left a lot and sending manufacturer out of the country isn't because the the wages are so significantly less. It's effectively they get tax deals and like um, even you know Macedonia was offering twenty year fixed rates. If you came and set up a, a plant there, we guarantee you will not have a, a tax increase for twenty years and. That is basically what they need. If you're going to do a business plan, it's going to take you 20 years to pay off the plant. You know, it has to be at a fixed rate. You can't constantly say, okay, fine, I'm paying, you know, 30% taxes. Oh, well, no, I want to win elections, so I'm going to make you pay 40 so I get elected. You know, 
you're costing jobs and everything leaves. It, it, it's not necessarily the the wages. It's the fact that it's just it's a yo-yo. So if it, it gets to the point, you cannot forecast mm-hmm. what your business plan is going to be. Yeah. So why would you sign a mortgage for something? And well, yeah, this is what it looks like today, but it, you know, it could completely change in three years. Mm-hmm. I know. Hey, so we're all in we the don't same look boat. at that. It, <laughs> it, you can't constantly have this back and forth. And I mean, the S and L crisis. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I was called in on that one, and basically, when they were going to pass it. Um, a few of the guys on the floor called me. He says, Marty, I think this is going to cause a real crash. I said, yes, it will. Because the Democrats got a hold of it. Then they said, oh, gee, all these rich people are making too much money off of real estate. So they changed the amortization to the point that nobody wanted to be in real estate. Then you had a one-sided market. Everybody tried to sell. Yeah. There was no bids. Okay. Just like any other market, it crashes. So all the, the property values collapsed. Then they said, oh, gee, this is fraud. And then they wanted to put people in SNL was in prison because they lent money on stuff that that would have been okay if they didn't change the tax rate. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it just, it, it's constantly, they always blame everybody else. Um, you take 2007, and it, it was just a joke. We are so over-regulated. And... You know, you say that and, and some Democrats, oh, no, you know, you have to have more regulation, otherwise this wouldn't have happened. We had seven agencies they had to go to, the banks, to get approval to sell these, these time bombs that blew up. <laughs> the first one, SEC granted. Okay, the second one, well, oh, they said it was okay? Okay, so then we did. None of them understood what the, what the product was. None of them. Yeah. And you had seven agencies all approved it, and then it blows up, and then they blame everybody else but themselves. That's mm-hmm. regulation? Yeah, yeah, so... You have people regulating things, they don't even understand what it is. We know that. We've seen that over and over again, and it's definitely true today. So where is the uh, stock market, precious metals, Bitcoin? Where are we headed at with all this, Marty? We're in the, the stock market uh, is... Um, I mean, it's it's basically consolidating a little bit, but effectively, the stock market still looks like it's going to about probably double from here. Um, mm-hmm. The the latest numbers are actually out from Eurostat, and and the, the biggest problem in in forecasting any of this stuff, the why the majority tend to be wrong, is because they're always looking at it only from a domestic perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, the Eurostats show that. 2016 was the first year there was net sellers of government bonds and in throughout Europe. So the foreigners basically in 2015 had still bought 30 billion worth of, of euro bonds. 2016, that 30 billion plus turned into 192 billion sale. Mm. So um, this is the first time there's been a net capital outflow from, from Europe. And uh, it's it's really been a disaster. But where did that money go? Even within Europe, the money that didn't come here, it went into equities. Sure. And you you have to realize that it's when we get into these situations, the bulk of the money is going to go in the stock market, not go old, because the major institutions. That's you know that's basically where you're talking about big money. That's that's where it can go. And what it is is that <clears throat> if you the evidence of that is also simply just look at the S&P and the P.E. ratio. You have a lot of these people saying, oh, you know, the stock market's way overvalued. It's got a crash. OK, now what's the historical high on the P.E. ratio and the S&P? 120. When did it take place? 2009. It doesn't take place on the peaks in stock markets. It takes peak on the bottom. That's when the P.E. ratio peaks out. Why? Because at that point in time, you don't trust the banks, you don't trust the debt, you don't trust governments. What do you do? they looking not for return. They're just saying, okay, fine. If I buy the blue chips, at least I know I'll get most of my money back. So return, you're parking. Yeah, return. That's it. Return. So it's got investment. nothing to do with, with you know, they, they talk about PE ratios. That's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. You know, as if you're you're looking from oh well, I'm going to, have to get on a, a return. It's it, you get to some point in time, you just want to park money. I mean, that's where 
you know, the 10 year bonds went negative in, in uh, Germany. Why? I can tell you, we had tons of European clients. It's a, it was a, all a bet against the euro because, okay, fine, if we buy the bonds and the euro breaks, we'll get Deutschmarks back. That's what the bet is. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, you know, you have to understand at this point in time, if you don't trust anybody, what are you going to do? And we're talking about huge, you know, the, the really big sums of money. And uh, all this nonsense about, you know, uh, fiat and all that, that's very nice, but everything's fiat. Uh, and it always has been, and that's not necessarily going to change. But um, at some point, the currency system you know, goes bust and we then have to be readjusted. All right. That will be coming. Absolutely. But how does it happen? All right. If, if these people keep talking, oh, the dollar is going to crash, whatever. If the dollar goes down, everybody will be happy. All right. You have <clears throat> the sovereign debt of, of the emerging markets is nearly half that of the United States. If the dollar goes down, they're fat and happy. If the, the only way to cause everything to, to actually collapse is the dollar has to go up. That's what it did going into 1985. What did you get out of it in 1985 when the pound fell to par? You got G5. That was the Plaza Accord. Okay. It's when the dollar goes up is when everybody is is upset. The dollar went up into 1931. You had Europe defaulting, China defaulted. That's why Roosevelt confiscated the gold to devalue the dollar. Mm -hmm. If the dollar went down, they wouldn't have need, needed protectionism and they wouldn't have confiscated gold. It's only when the dollar goes up. What is Trump trying to do? Trump wants a lower dollar. Why? Because then he'll be able to sell more goods. He's going to be defeated because the dollar goes up. Yeah. Not damn. So, you know, I'm not optimistic about Trump's ideas on, on foreign exchange either. And his view that, oh, China is manipulating its currency, that's a joke. China is going af after Bitcoin because Bitcoin was, was the number one way of getting money out of China. Yeah, it put all kinds of restraints on it now, but they were moving money, you know, uh, out of <clears throat> China through Bitcoin and then converting it to dollars. Uh -huh. So um, <clears throat> that's why the currency was going down. Trump was wrongly blaming them. Oh, they're manipulating their currency down so they can sell us more stuff. No, that was the people trying to get the money out of China. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to look behind the curtain here a little bit. And um, but it you push the dollar up. Now you're going to get the sovereign debt crisis. You're going to have the emerging markets going bust. You're going to have, you know, a lot of problems even in Europe, etc. So um, the Fed raising interest rates is putting pressure on the ECB. You know, they now have seen the first 2016 has been net capital outflows. If he does not reverse his policy soon, Europe is going to be an absolute basket case. And you're lucky it's holding together right now. They're trying desperately to rig the elections in France because they're afraid if Le Pen wins, that's it. It's good night, Irene. Think she's going to win? It's difficult to say, and I'll tell you why. I mean, <clears throat> our computer forecast that she would win over the socialists and the socialists would collapse. That has happened. Holland's not even running. Um, now you have Macron basically started his own party in August. Okay, so it's a brand new party. So all the other parties have basically really disintegrated. So um, he may win if, all, if people who would have voted for all the other parties vote for him. Mm -hmm. But on the first round, he's at 24%, she's at 25 So it, it's still tight. Um, but, you know, again, the, you know, if she basically were to win, then the euro would, would begin immediately to collapse. However, let's say she loses, all right? Brussels is going to sigh, you know, you know, relief and wipe their brow. But effectively, it means that they're going to say, okay, our policies are still all right for now. Yeah, no reason. They won't change anything. Yeah. And our computer's projecting that 2018, that's it. That's it. I mean, the euro may completely go off the boards by 2020. And, and um, it, the structural design is just a disaster. And they, they never did it correctly from, you know, from the start.
So, I mean, to put it in American terms, there are no federal bonds, and every bank uses state bonds for reserves. Now, Mississippi goes down. What's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, okay, which bank has the most of Mississippi bonds? <laughs> you know, it goes into total chaos. Um, so the bank, banking system in Europe is 10 times worse than the United States, uh, maybe even 20, because they, have, they basically had to be politically correct, so they had to own a piece of each state. So Greece goes down, or the, or the ratings get killed on the southern Europe. They lose on the reserves. Mm -hmm. That's why the banking system over there is a, a complete nightmare. Yeah. So then you have the ECB um, <clears throat> taking rates negative and trying to punish the banks. So what did they do? I can tell you, I have plenty of, of clients over there. Very simple. They opened up U.S. branch offices over here. Once they have a branch bank in the United States, what can they do? Open it. Now they have to be regulated by the Fed. Yeah. So they sent the money over here. The the U.S. branch deposited the Fed. You have nearly three trillion dollars in excess reserves that the Fed pays interest on for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, you can't make Brilliant. up this stuff. I mean, Brilliant. it's like the Keystone cops running everything. So final question, then we'll let you go. Precious metals, gold and silver, they coming out of the uh, long, uh, long depression here or more of the same? Soon, but pro I mean, after this year, but you know, what you have to keep in mind is it forget all the nonsense of, of, of demand and fiat and all that kind of stuff. It means nothing. All right. When does gold go up? It goes up when people lose confidence in government. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go up because of inflation and all this other nonsense that, that a lot of these gold promoters put out. I mean, if you take the 1980 high and you, you adjust it for inflation, it's $2,300. We haven't exceeded the 1983 high. Um, in 19, in 1980, the, the, uh, uh, the Dow was at a thousand. So and the gold hasn't even kept pace with the Dow. It makes major bursts up, but it does so when there is a collapse in confidence. So that's what we're heading into. All right. But it's probably not going to start really until after 2018. And people have to, and it's not just the gold, you know, the, the people that are interested in gold and holding that. You're talking about the, the other people who are not. Those are the ones you have to convince. And you're not going to convince them with hyperinflation scenarios, which don't materialize, and inflation. It's, that's not going to be it. It's the same thing as what the S&P with the, the peak and the P.E. ratio was 2009. When you don't trust anything, that's when you go. Right. So we have to look at the confidence level. We have these elections coming up, and each one is whittling away a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You have the German elections coming up in the fall. All right. So <clears throat> each it doesn't look like Merkel is going to win. I mean, Schultz might might beat her. And so each one of these things is, is basically contributing to this whole problem. And Trump is just the symptom. He is not the, the leader of the charge, and he happened to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah, he so people are just fed up. Yes. And I mean, you, you basically look at Obama, you can Google his, his ads when he first ran against Bush standing before factories, oh, I'm going to bring jobs back, blah, 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 blah. They still, you know, Guantanamo Bay, oh, that's illegal. Um, NSA, oh, what he's doing there. When he became president, he, all right, jobs didn't come back. Guantanamo Bay is still there, and he gave more power to the NSA. Mm -hmm. Everything he said that Bush was doing unconstitutionally, he did in spades. So sure. effectively, the people are looking at it and saying, wait a minute, if you disagreed with Bush, because of those things, then you voted for Obama, then you saw he did the same thing. So who do you vote for now? Good question. So, you know, if it's Republican or it's, or it's Democrat, you know, you get the same thing. Mm -hmm. So Trump was interesting in the sense that he's really a third party candidate because his own people within the Republican were against him. For sure. So um, it's more of a third party movement. 
So it's fascinating from that perspective, but this is global. It's happening everywhere. So you're looking at, uh, in Germany, when I go over to Germany, you go to Southern Germany and Bavaria, and they say, no, we're Bavarian first, German second. <laughs> they still celebrate winning the war against the North. You know, it's like, um, it's, you know, you go to, to, to Britain, it's Scotland against, uh, against the English. Yeah. Uh, it, it's everywhere you go. Spain, I was there in Barcelona. They voted to separate from Spain. Um, I think you're going to see Greece pull out of the, out of the euro. Uh, the people are just getting fed up. Yeah. It doesn't matter. They, they voted for the new party that swore they were going to take them out of the euro. And what they do? They put them more, you know, they just borrowed more to keep it in. <laughs> yeah. There's no change. No, no change. That's for certain. Well, so, but, so just look for for those things and, and understand it's a confidence game at this point. This yeah. And when did the medals take off? It's when the majority of people begin to question what's going on. Yeah, which we're, is going to happen. We're getting there, but yeah. it's still going to take a little bit more time.